Hello. My talk today takes us to the northernmost site in Israel, Tel Abel Beit Ma'acha, a very large tell sitting right on the present day border between Israel and Lebanon. Abel Beit Ma'acha is situated in the fertile Hula Valley on one of the main north-south routes in the country, today called Road 90, and also on connecting east-west routes. These modern roads reflect ancient routes as the geography remains virtually unchanged. This map shows just how close the Tel is to the Lebanese coast. To the west, a mere 35 kilometer drive, and to Damascus in Syria, 70 kilometers to the east as the crow flies. Unfortunately, modern politics prevent us from making these easy drives today. But let's keep in mind that this strategic location was a major factor in the regional and national importance of Abel Beit Ma'acha over the millennia. As the saying goes, location, location, location. Abel Beit Ma'acha is mentioned three times in the Bible. Once in relation to a military campaign by the Aramean king Ben-Hadad in the 9th century BC, and once about another campaign, this time by the Assyrian king Tiglat Pilasar III in the 8th century BC. The third reference tells the compelling story of a fellow named Sheva ben Bichri who rebelled against King David. He fled the king's wrath all the way north up to Abel Beit Ma'acha to hide out. David's army pursued him and was about to destroy the city when a wise woman emerged and saved the day by having the rebel beheaded. Such a wise woman can be understood as a kind of local oracle who practiced divination and also fulfilled a role of leadership in her community, kind of an early example of feminism, if you wish. Aside from these three references, the Bible mentions a small kingdom called Ma'acha alongside another called Geshur. These are conventionally thought to have been Aramean, based solely on a few biblical verses. Some scholars have proposed that Abel Beit Ma'acha was the capital of this purported kingdom, although this is not explicit in the Bible nor in any other text. This indeed was one of the questions we set out to explore. Could we identify a connection to the Iron Age kingdom of Aram Damascus so close by as you have just seen? This is a significant question since southern Syria remains terra incognito from an archaeological standpoint. Thus, if we can shed light on these events so explicitly described in the Bible, it would comprise a significant contribution. Tel Abel Beit Ma'acha had never been excavated before we initiated our project in 2013. We are Professor Naamaya Halom Mack and myself on behalf of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Professor Robert Mullins of Azusa Pacific University in Los Angeles. Ten seasons of digging since then have produced many significant finds and have contributed to our knowledge of the site and the region in the Bronze and the Iron Ages. One major insight we learned is that there were a few peaks of occupation, including Middle Bronze Age II from about 1800 to 1550 BC, Iron Age I from about 1200 to 980 BC, and somewhat surprisingly, Iron Age IIa from about 980 to 830 or maybe 800 BC. Why surprisingly? That's the point that I would like to focus on now by putting Abel Beit Ma'acha into the geopolitical context of that portentous time. The Iron Age 2A city contained many impressive public buildings. Among them is this large storehouse with at least five long rooms. This plan is similar to well-known Iron Age 2 structures at sites such as Israelite Chatzor and Megiddo that are usually interpreted as storehouses or stables for horses. In one of the rooms in the building, we found more than 35 complete storage jars, all locally made 
at or near the site. One of them bore a Hebrew inscription in ink with the name Binayo. The theophoric ending of this name, Yo, indicates that this fellow, possibly the owner of the storehouse or a local merchant, had an Israelite name. Another impressive Iron Age II edifice is this massive structure that we define as a citadel, occupying the highest part of the tell in the north. While not quite the same architectural plan, it can be likened to a large citadel built at Chatzor at around the same time. This complex contains several prestigious items, such as this beautiful Phoenician Bikram stores jar imported from Lebanon, and our prize find, the, elite, the head of an elite male, or a king, made in a unique style out of faience. It looks colossal in this photo, but in fact, it's only five centimeters high and probably was attached to a body that is now missing. Today it is in, exhibited in the Israel Museum. Another interesting find from the Iron Age 2A was a jar containing 406 astragali bones. These are animal knuckle bones. Similar hordes with hundreds of astragali were found at contemporary Israelite sites such as Megiddo and Ta'anach. Such bones were used in antiquity as game pieces, kind of like playing jacks, or quite likely for divination. Our analysis of the hoard led us to wonder if this might reflect a local tradition of divination that is alluded to in the story of the wise woman. Of course, this is just speculation, but as biblical archaeologists, we are open to exploring such ideas. Now, a word about chronology. We ascribe the finds I just described to the late 10th and the 9th centuries BC based on various material culture features, particularly the pottery, as well as carbon, radiocarbon dates obtained from short-lived organic samples such as olive pits. Thus, we are confident that the site was robustly occupied during a large part, if not all, of the Iron Age 2A. So what about the Arameans, you may ask at this point? What about that possibly Aramean kingdom called Ma'acha? After 10 years of digging, we can confidently say that there is no material evidence of such ties between the Arameans and Abel Beit Ma'acha. Of course, political affiliation does not necessarily express itself in material items, but one would expect some cultural transmission would have transpired. We continue to explore this question, but in the meantime, Abel Beit Ma'acha cannot be ascribed to the Aramean realm in the Iron Age 2A. What then can we say about the cultural and political affiliation of Abel Beit Ma'acha at this critical time in history? when the territorial kingdoms of the southern Levant, Israel, Judah, Moab, Ammon, Edom, and Phoenicia were developing and flourishing. We have established that during this period, Abel Beit Ma'acha was a thriving urban center with economic and cultural ties to both the Israelite kingdom and the Phoenician coast. But, we can, but can we go a step further and say something about its political affiliation? Who did the inhabitants of the city pay their taxes to? What was the official cult? Who did they ally with or clash with in battle? Was the city part of the Israelite kingdom, or was it in federation with the strong Phoenician cities of Tyre or Sidon? Or was Abel Beit Ma'achaz an independent political entity, culturally influenced by the surrounding powers, but politically and economically independent? These questions are difficult, if not impossible, to answer, but we venture to say that the architectural and artifactual data so far point to the possibility that during the 9th century BC, Abel Beit Ma'acha could have been politically affiliated with the Israelite kingdom. We can explain the strong Phoenician element at the site not necessarily as the result of geographic proximity to the coast, 
but it also is reflecting the close relationship between the Israelite kingdom and Phoenicia, as expressed in the diplomatic marriage between the notorious Jezebel and King Ahab, and the extensive Phoenician architectural and artistic traditions typically found throughout northern Israel. This scenario of an Israelite affiliation for Abel Beit Ma'acha in the 9th century BC can and should be weighed against the background of an idea propounded by some scholars in recent years. They claim that in the 9th century, the border of the Israelite kingdom did not reach as far north as Abel Beit Ma'acha or nearby Dan. They concluded that this latter site, Dan, was virtually abandoned until the last quarter of this century, when the Aramean king Hazael conquered the Hula Valley and built the gate and the fortifications at Dan, erecting the famous House of David Stila in commemoration of his victory. They concluded that following the gap in most of the ninth century, this far northern end of the Hula Valley was Aramean and not Israelite. The situation changed only in the early 8th century BC, mainly during the reign of Jeroboam II, who instituted Israelite political control of this border region. However, our excavations at Tel Abel Beit Ma'acha have provided robust evidence that it was a dynamic and well-developed city during Iron II A, and was occupied during all of the 9th century BC with no apparent gap. So this region was not as empty as those scholars suggest, at least not at Abel Beit Ma'acha. The city enjoyed strong cultural and economic ties with the Israelite kingdom and the Phoenician cities. As I noted, the evidence supports the possibility of a political affiliation with the Israelite kingdom, although the prospect of Abel Beit Ma'acha being an autonomous political entity situated between Israel and Phoenicia cannot be ruled out. And as I pointed out, and I will repeat, after 10 years of excavation, we can virtually rule out any particular Aramean association, political association at that time, although we may surmise that there was interaction that the archaeological record as of now does not reflect. The excavations at Tel Abel Beit Ma'acha have contributed much to our knowledge of this border region and emphasize the complexity of the interface between political, cultural, and economic relationships as they can be inferred from the archaeological record. More excavations and analyses are needed to help round out the fascinating historical scenario between Israelites, Phoenicians, and Arameans in the Iron Age II in this border region. Thank you very much.